In our country, we are now broadcasting virtually, and there will come a time where we'll be back together in the house of the Lord. So for now, join me, join us in our Sunday worship as we move forward in the strength of Jesus, where above all else, sound doctrine is uh, taught, sound doctrine is lived here at First African Baptist Church. God bless you, my beloved. Let's get into today's sermon. Wrath on unrighteousness, and this is part two of Romans 1, 18 through 32 on the why, on the how part. Now, as we went from uh, 18 through 25 on the uh, why on last Sunday, we talked about uh, 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 it was sin that caused the uh, wrath of God to fall upon a deserving nation such as ourselves and many other nations prior to us. Now, on today's lesson, as we go through the how, we're going to kind of segue part of last week's uh, lesson into this week's lesson. So we're going to start at verse 24, then work our way down through verse 32 on this. My name is Pastor Alexander McBride, and I welcome all viewers to our sun, uh, Sunday sermon, How God's Wrath on Unrighteousness is revealed. And just to give you a bit of an overview of Romans 1, 2, and 3, because all three chapters have to be taken in uh, uh, context here. Uh, chapter 1, after the introduction, tells about how the Gentiles are, uh, are uh, without excuse. And then chapter 2 tells about how the Jews are without excuse. And then chapter 3 say, uh, covers everything that we are all without excuse. Because in Paul writing to the mainly Gentile Roman church here, uh, he just he wants to let everybody know. He wants to let everybody know that we are all without excuse. So with that said, my beloved, let's get on into the lesson. But I would be remiss if I did not open with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this time and privilege of expounding your word, especially Romans, to these your people. And even as I look into the mirror of my own soul, myself also. Lord, please open up our minds and our hearts and help us to understand your written word because this is all we have to go by right now. Even though the heavens declare your glory, Lord God, the salvation of uh, our souls is wrapped up in your word so that we may know truth, uncompromised, and in healthy soundness of doctrine. So with that said, Lord, please touch us. I ask that you would touch my mouth, my mind, and my heart, so that I may deliver this word, uh, not only with soundness and doctrine, but with love and character and care, O oh Lord, to these, your people, as well as to myself. Touch the leaders of our nation, O oh Lord, from the president on down, Lord God. We ask for wisdom, not just for ourselves, but especially for those in leadership, as all that they do, Lord, has to do with uh, uh, consequences on our life. Lord, touch the upcoming election. Help all people to get out to vote, regardless of who they vote for. Help us to see, Lord God, the need to get out and make our voices to be heard. And then, Lord, I pray for uh, this pandemic that is upon the world now, that you would have mercy one more time, even the mercy, Lord, that would allow us to come back into the house of worship and, and come face to face one with the other. Lord, I thank you for helping us to realize what we have missed since we have been out. Therefore, Lord, help us not forget what we have missed. We pray and ask this in your darling son, Jesus' name, and the church of God said amen. Now, with that said, my beloved, I ask you to open your Bibles to Romans, the first chapter, and we're going to start with the 24th verse, and I know I've covered 24 and 25, but we need to kind of merge that to make sense of today's sermon also. So starting with verse 24 of the first chapter of Romans in the New Testament. Here we go. This is Paul writing to mostly a Gentile crew right here. Wherefore, therefore, King James Version, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie 
and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Now we take up this Sunday also. For this cause or for this reason, God gave them up into vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another. Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was uh, meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same thing, but have pleasure in them that do them. My goodness, my love. <coughs> now, as we go into today's uh, sermon, we want to understand the how. We, as I said before, we talked about the why. So without further ado, we go right into the lesson. 24 through 32. Let's look at the first part. Therefore, God gave them over in their hearts to self-control and purity that their bodies might be honored among themselves for they kept and cherished the truth of God and worshiped and served the Creator who is blessed forever rather than the creature. Amen. Okay, now for this reason God gave them over to this pure and wholesome lives, lived with carefree ease even in the most intimate relations so that all received in their own persons the due reward of their faithfulness. And just as they saw fit to acknowledge God in all things, God gave them over to a sound mind to do those things which are proper, being filled with righteousness, goodness, generosity, kindness, full of selflessness, life, healing, openness, kindness. They are gentle in speech, always building others up, Lovers of God, respectful, humble, self-effacing, uh, inventors of good, obedient to parents, understanding, trustworthy, loving, merciful, and as they know the ordinance of God or the laws of God, that those who practice such things are possessors of life. They do the same and give hearty approval to those who do likewise. Now, obviously, I'm being very facetious here. By reversing Paul's thought here, the opposite side of the coin, the tail side of the head, the opposite side of the coin, or the antithesis, one of the most terrible portions of scripture becomes sublime. God's grace brings freedom from bondage, light from darkness, life from death. These verses leave little doubt about which to smile. At the same time, the truth they hold is needed today as much as any other time in history, especially in the history of our nation here. As we've seen, the background of the passage consists of this. All unbelievers, every unbeliever, suppress the truth of God's external power and divine nature as they refuse to honor him and exchange the great truth for the lie. They bring about an idol-making perversion of the truth. They form gods after their own self and after their own futile minds. And finally, their suppression and perversion of the truth culminates in a perversion of life until God gives them over to their sin. After a while, the mercy of God runs out. You don't want God in the picture. God gets out of the picture. God allows men and women to go as far down as they desire to go down that rabbit hole. And his wrath is shown 
in the removal of his restraining power. And that's why I say, my beloved, that we are not waiting on the wrath of God to come and display itself on America and on the world. The wrath of God is already being displayed because of the things that are happening. We can see the signs in front of us if we would just read the word of God and look. What we have in verses 24 through 32 are the dimensions of this depravity to which unbelieving men and women will go in working out God's wrath on themselves. You know, and that's why I titled this sermon, How God's Wrath is Revealed. The how part, God uses his wrath concerning this depravity. He, he, he shows the how in the senses, the how in the mentality, and the ultimate laws of everything that is rational. And as we discuss the sensual dimensions of this, we will do our best to stay within the bounds of propriety. At the same time, we must speak the truth. So let's get right into it, my love. Verses 24 through 27, let's deal with the senses. Therefore, God gave them over. God gave them over. He abandoned them. That is the raft of abandonment that is now already being displayed. Therefore, God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for the lie, a lie, and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised in the Church of God. And the Bible said, Amen. Because of this, God then gave them over to shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way that men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversions. 24 through 27. Let's talk about that in plain language. The plain language that Paul is talking about here was referring to sexual perversion. Heterosexual men and women and in verse 24, homosexual uh, inversion, verses 26 and 27. And while both are in view, the emphasis is upon the homosexual inversion as an illustration of the extremity of mankind's depravity. The text is even more explicit in the original than in our English translations. The word used for men and women are literally male and female. So that verse 26 and 27 reads just like this, my beloved. For their females exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. In the same way, the males abandon the natural function of the female and burn in their desire toward one another. Males with males committed indecent acts and receiving in one's own persons the due penalty of their error. Now, there is no doubt in anybody's mind, certainly not in this military mind here, as to what the apostle is talking about. Why does Paul, in describing the death of mankind's depravity, turn first to sexual sins, especially homosexuality? There are other sins which are just as bad. You know, C.S. Lewis wrote, if anyone thinks that Christians regard unchastity as the supreme vice, he is quite wrong. The sins of the flesh are bad. Bad, but they are at least bad, uh, they are the least bad of all sins. He went on further to say, all the worst pleasures are purely spiritual. The pleasure of putting other people in the wrong, of bossing and patronizing and spoiling sport and backbiting, the pleasure of power, of hatred, for there are two things inside me competing with the human self which I must try to become. They are the animal self and the diabolical self. And the diabolical self is worse than the animal self. That is why a cold, self-righteous person who goes regularly to church may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute out in the street. But of course, it's better to be neither one. Amen, church. So why does Paul single out homosexuality then? Because it is so obviously unnatural and therefore automatically underlines the extent to which sin takes mankind. 
Other sins are just as evil, but they are naturally evil. God has emphasized the sin of inversion to show us that inside the unbelieving man is a running sore, which indicates a far deeper dimension of the wounds of sinful society. We should note that in chapter 1, it ends with the sins of the mind and spirit of which all sinners are guilty. I would also offer a brief word to those who are involved in homosexual inversion. It's not a sickness, my beloved. It is a sin. And that ought to be encouraging news to you because there is a remedy for sin, whereas many sicknesses have no cure. The scriptures indicate that homosexuality is a sin from which anyone and someone and you can can uh, recover from. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God, says the Bible in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. And he said, that and that is what some of you were. And so the church is filled with the sin-sick souls because the church is the hospital for the sin-sick soul. So as long as you recognize what the illness is, it's not just a sickness as prescribed by man, but it is sin as dictated by God. And for sin, there is a balm in Gilead, and there is a remedy in the court and the pharmacy of God. Some of the Corinthians were previously homosexuals, some were drunkards, some were thieves, but they were washed and they were cleansed. Paul also emphasized this sin because it was all around him. He was writing from Corinth, the sin capital of the world at that time of Asia. Greek culture taught that homosexual love was the purest and the highest forms of love. And many high-born Greeks maintained male lovers along with their wives. It was no different in Rome, just like it's no different in some of the churches today. Too many times, folks think by getting married, it'll help them to overcome their depravity. But the only marriage that will help us overcome our depravity is the marriage between us and Jesus Christ. Amen, church. Sounds like today, does it not? Romans 1 describes any major city in the world today. Hong Kong, San Francisco, Vienna, Buford. Amen. A mainline uh, Denominations magazine carried an astonishment that said essentially that homosexuality should be accepted as a variant lifestyle. The homosexual relationship is neither unnatural, sinful, nor sick. In this article, practicing homosexuals were portrayed as whole, healthy, and appealing persons. But at the end of verse 27, Paul completes his thought on this subject with an uh, ominous statement. He said, and they received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. And anyone who has counseled anybody in bondage to this sin, as I have on many occasions, know that Paul is talking about a loss of personal identity and uncertainty as one's role and place is in life. Yet there is another element to which is substantiated by the statement's parallelism in verse 24, the degrading of their bodies. God's wrath falls as a penalty on their very bodies. The great pox that some people know about of uh, Columbus's sailors introduced a virulent strain of syphilis which spread to the rest of the world in less than 100 years. The disease existed from far more distant time, but never like this. In 1972, issue of Time said this in its article, after the ordinary cold, syphilis and gonorrhea are the most common infectious diseases among young people today, outranking all cases of hepatitis, measles, mumps, scarlet fever, strep throat, and tuberculosis put together. That was in 1972. Who knows what the status is today? The sexually transmitted herpes virus infection can also be dated to ancient times, but today is still an epidemic. In 1982, time cover story, the new scarlet letter revealed that an estimated 20 million Americans, 20 million, that's two zero 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 zero, 20 million Americans now have sexually communicated herpes. Worse, it is completely incurable. As time said, it won't kill you, but you won't kill it either. Oh my goodness. The reason for the virus 
exponential increase according to time has been the escalation of sexual license. Free love. By far the most terrifying event to those involved in sexual perversion is the occurring largely in the gay community of AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome from which the victims lose their immunities to disease and eventually die of pneumonia. Cis, uh, 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 I can pronounce it. How is it? Pneumocystis. You know what I'm talking about. Pneumonia or a cancer called uh, Kaposi's uh, sarcoma. The receiving in themselves the due penalty for their perversion is an outworking of the wrath of God because of the suppression of truth. You know how to cure it. You know how to get rid of it. But you'd rather live the lifestyle than stop the lifestyle. But it's also a sign of the grace of God for a couple of reasons. The first sign that is of the grace of God is first the fear of contracting a sexually transmitted disease is a great inducement and deterrent to refrain from sexual license. Married and unmarried philanthropists have become extremely wary. Monogamy and fidelity are on the upswing. But there is a second element of God's grace, and that is that some people go through the pain of disease and personal fragmentation have come to the end of themselves and they have become finally ready for a massive dose of God's grace. It is their only hope. How many times on a hospital bed with their heads laying on the pillow that I've wiped tears from their eyes of repentant homosexuals, repentant heterosexuals, repenters all around. Ain't nothing like being flat on your back to make you look up towards heaven. Somebody ought to say amen. Amen, church. If we are unbelievers, it is meant to drive us as it did the brilliant physician that we mentioned earlier to faith. Most of us are not caught in the sins of perversion and inversion. Perhaps we could congratulate ourselves, God help us if we do, on not having committed those sins. But none of us, I mean not one of us, none of us, whether as non-believers or even as believers, can truly deny experiencing most of the dimensions of mental depravity. So let's talk a little bit about this mental depravity. It affects the mind, verse 28 through 31. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased or reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, full of murder, full of strife, full of deceit, evil mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undeserving, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, and unmerciful. Oh my goodness, my goodness, my goodness, my beloved. <laughs> Paul says that unbelieving minds become depraved minds. Paul says that unbelieving minds become depraved minds. Hmm. Literally, they are given over to a rejected mind. They rejected God and God rejected their mental attitude. Cranfield says that such a mind is so debilitated and corrupted as to be a quite untrustworthy guide in moral decisions. This does not mean that man is as bad as he could be, for there's always room to become worse than what we are. Paul then gives in verse 29 through 31 the specific dimensions of a depraved mind. It would be easy to imagine that these are the exaggerations of an hysterical moralist that some people call Paul, but the Greek and Roman writers said the same thing themselves and sometimes even more about themselves. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. Verse 29, the first part. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. All the way down to verse 31. 
These are the dimensions of the depraved mind or rejected mind. Not all those who are without Christ have done all these things, but these kinds of things come most naturally to them. The tendency is for deeper and deeper decline. It's easier to go downhill than it is to climb uphill. So now that brings us to the final verse Verse 32, the ultimate loss of everything, who knowing the righteousness of the judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Verse 32, which gives the ultimate dimension of the sinful mind, neatly framed this terrible picture. Although they know God's righteousness decree that those who do such things deserve death, but not only continue to do those things, but those that also approve of those that practice them. Man reaches the nadir of depravity when he heartily applauds those who give themselves to sin. To delight in those who do evil is a sure way to become even more degraded than the sinners that do the things themselves. This, I think, is one of the supreme horrors of the Roman Colosseum. Those committing the mayhem were supremely guilty, killing one another. Yes, they were, but those watching and applauding were perhaps even more wretched. What a telling application this is on our uh, media-captivated society today. Millions sit in their living rooms watching debauchery, violence, revenge, deceit, and many other vices and applaud what they see, even getting a kick out of it by vicariously living through it. It makes the difference whether the vices, uh, it makes no difference whether the vices are real or portrayed. The effect is the same thing, an increasingly depraved mind on the part of the viewer. Approving another sin or encouraging another sin is a sign that life has reached its lowest dimension. We Christians are not exempt from this. Satan knows that if he can get us to laugh at things we believe we should never do, our defenses will fall down. Maybe someday our unwitting approval will give way to action. We need to be careful what we watch. We need to be careful what we clap our hands to. Thomas Aquinas pointed out, according to Psalms 8, man is made a little lower than the angels. This suggests that man is in a position somewhere between the angels above and the beasts below. Angels are spirits without bodies. Sometimes they take on bodies, but they are spirit beings. And animals are bodies without spirits. Man is in between because he has a body and a spirit. This puts man in a mediating position. It has always been man's prerogative to move upward toward the spiritual or downward toward the animal. And we become like that upon which we focus. This is why we cannot sin just a little bit. All sin moves us downhill individually, nationally, and culturally. As our society has moved downward toward the beast, no one seems to be able to say, to be able to say, this far and no farther. No one can put a limit on sensuality. Incest is even being promoted by some. Our culture has been unable to draw the line on pornography. Such are the dimensions of depravity. So I ask you, my beloved, uh, what is the answer? You ask me, my beloved, what is the answer? Uh, why does God give a civilization over to this kind of thing? He does it because when darkness prevails and despair and violence is widespread, men and women are most ready to come to the light. He gives mankind up so that their despair might give themselves to his grace. Do you remember Isaiah's prediction? The people walking in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. Isaiah 9 and 2. In the first century, mankind was sunk in the darkness of despair. Idolatry had penetrated the whole world. Men had turned from the true God whom they could have known. In that hour, in the darkness of the night, over the skies of Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the angels broke through and a great light of hope shone up forth. From that hope, from that hope, all light streams, the angels' message was the coming of the Lord Jesus, the availability of the gift of righteousness from God. 
against the growing darkness of our own time. We need to make this message as clear as we possibly can by our testimony, by our lives, by the joys and by the peace of heaven in our hearts. God has found a way to break through human weakness, arrogance, despair, and sinfulness to give us peace, joy, and gladness. Just as Jesus was born in Bethlehem so long ago, he can be born in anybody's heart now today. This is the good news of the gospel. In this decaying world in which we live, we can see again the glory of this truth as it delivers people from their sins. You are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Matthew 1 and 21. In Ephesians, the second chapter, Paul again paints a similar picture of the dimensions of man's depravity, concluding in verse 3 with, we were nature by nature, optics of wrath. However, he does not stop there, but he continues to say, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in sins and transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms of Christ Jesus in order that the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, through faith, and this not from yourself. It is the gift of God. Christ came in the darkest night and he can meet us even in the midnight of our souls. You therefore have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge somebody else, you're condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same thing. Now we know that God's judgment against those who do such things is based on truth. So when you, a mere man, pass judgment on them and yet do the same thing, do you think you'll escape God's wrath? The answer is a resounding no. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, the riches of his tolerance, the riches of his patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance. But because of your stubbornness and your unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath when his righteous judgment will be revealed. God will give to each person according to what he or she has done to those who by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking, who reject the truth and follow evil, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human who does evil, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism or partiality. All who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. And all who sin under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not, for it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Oh my goodness. For indeed when Gentiles, the Bible say, who did do not have the law, do by nature things required by the law. They are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their conscience also bear witness, and their thoughts now accusing, now even defending them. This will take place on the day when God would judge man's secret through Jesus Christ as the gospel declares. My beloved, God judges the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. The law I'm talking about is the law of liberty. That law of loving the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving thy neighbor as thyself. This is the grace of God given to us. And the faith and the good news of God is that we can accomplish these things through Christ. It is not that you have reached your destination, but it is that you are on a journey towards your destination. You slip and fall sometimes, you have doubtful thoughts sometimes, but oh my beloved, get up, 
get up, shake it off, shake it loose, and keep on traveling. This is not the time to give up now. Now is the time to put on the whole armor. Now is the time to bear strong faith in God. Now is the time to trust God in all your ways. Do not lean to your own understanding. Discern what the times of the time is now. And then, my beloved, we'll understand better by and by. Next week, we jump into chapter 2, where it says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges, for when wherein thou judges another, thou condemn thyself, for thou that judges do the same thing that the one you judge. So until next time, my beloved, join us here. The vet Cornell live before the face.